Good morning. So good to see each of you here this morning. And for those of you who may be visiting with us, we want to give you a very special welcome because we love to have visitors. We love to have members of our family that we haven't met yet because when you come into our church, you are a part of our family. We love to have visitors and want you to feel that truly you are at home. Did you see the beautiful entryway onto the church grounds? Listen, I don't want to embarrass her, but that Eva Sexton is something else. I'm glad you did that because if I should be privileged to have her funeral service, but I think that I'll be going long before she, the one thing that I will say that wherever she stopped and touched the world, it became beautiful because she certainly does that all over town and now in front of our church and every Sunday on the altar. I, I pledge you this, there is not a church in the area of Holston Conference of any denomination that has more beautiful floral arrangements Sunday after Sunday than we do here at First Church. And I hope we never take it for granted because she does a magnificent job. And then now she started on the beautification of the grounds and it's just really outstanding. And I want us to feel in our hearts a deep appreciation for Eva for the time that she puts in to, to making things beautiful. <clears throat> oh Lord, our God, you have granted us as your children a great freedom to create our world in your image, but often we shun the light of your truth for the comfortable darkness of our little caves. We sometimes become wedded to outmoded ways of living because they are comfortable, and we fear the discomfort that change can bring. However, in the process of trying to conserve our ways of life, we find ourselves at times transgressing and destroying values that our forefathers have achieved for us at great sacrifice. Heal our blindness, God. Lead us by the light of your truth so that we may see ourselves as we really are, free persons endowed with great creative powers, if we will only use them in the way you meant for them to be used. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have come a long way on our journey. A journey that began at the beginning of Lent a search for the things that make for peace. Remembering that Jesus said at the conclusion of his life, if only you knew the things that make for peace, but now your house is left unto you desolate. We determined that we would not leave, live in desolate houses but that we would find the things about which he spoke, those things that make for peace. 
And our first journey was the journey for an inner peace, a peace of mind. And we discovered those measures that we must take in order to find that. We set out on the pathway that led to the gift of peace that only God can give, realizing that there is a limit to which we can go in finding inner peace, but God promised the gift of peace beyond which we can attain. We set out upon the pathway that showed us Peace comes by doing battle with those things that stand between us and God. Breaking down those barriers and vanquishing those foes bring us peace. But in the last analysis, all journeys begin and end with one person and one place. Jesus Christ. We have always dreamed that there would be a person or a thing that could fulfill our greatest dreams and desires. We have fabricated them in the imagination of our minds, the possibility that one would suddenly appear that could grant us our wishes. The bottle with the genie. King Arthur and his knights set out to discover the Holy Grail. Fairy tales to design those personages that can grant us our three wishes. The leprechauns with a magic touch. And somewhere in the deep recesses of our mind lies that hungering thought if only I had someone to grant me the things that I want. And he's here. One who can do more than genies in bottles. One who can accomplish more than Arthur and his knights of the round table. One whose abilities far outreach the imagination of anyone's mind in writing fairy tales. There is one who can accomplish everything we need, give us every gift we desire. And yet, we pass him by. Perhaps the greatest sin in the world is this. We do not take him seriously. We all acknowledge the fact that he came into the world. We retrace his life on earth. We celebrate his resurrection following his death. And yet we don't take him seriously. The rewards of which is as though he never came. In yesterday's newspaper, there was a column written by a researcher a poll had been taken of those persons who attend church. Not of the general population, but of those people who attend church regularly. The major denominations were polled, representing over 35 million Christians. And the question asked was this, do you find a spiritual serenity and peace? in your relationship with God? Do you have a vital faith that allows you to have that kind of peace? Two-thirds answered no. An evangelist some years ago said, the most fertile mission field in the world is the vestibule of the church. You see, we just won't take him seriously. And in our time, we have found those who poke fun at him. There's only been one person in history 
that can attain the magnitude of Jesus Christ. He came from God on a special mission. He fulfilled it, and we are the recipients of that mission. If only we'll take him and allow him to transform our lives and bring into us that peace and that serenity that all of us seek above everything else. Fulton Owsler wrote a book he titled Modern Parables, and in it he told about a brilliant European doctor who specialized in children's diseases. There was one rare disease that was inevitably fatal, but little research had been done in the field of that disease because it was so rare. But he set out to find a way to treat it. He gained milestones in his research. He began to publish the results of treatment where those who were doomed to death now were alive and well. And so he was invited to come to America to speak to a medical convention to share with them the results of what he had been able to accomplish. He came. The convention was held in Chicago. And when an item appeared in the newspaper about his coming, it told of the research that he had done for this rare disease that was inevitably fatal otherwise. And a mother read those words whose daughter suffered from that terrible illness. And suddenly her heart began to beat quickly. Here was a possibility of life for her child who was dying. Desperately, she tried to get in touch with that doctor to see if he would treat her daughter while he was here in Chicago. As chances would allow, he was staying in a hotel just a short distance from where the woman lived. And on the evening prior to his appearance before the medical society, he went for a stroll in the cool air of the evening. Suddenly there was a downpour of rain and he wasn't prepared for it. And he rushed up to the nearest door and he hammered upon the door. And the lady came to the door and he said, will you let me come in out of the rain? And she said, no, I have a sick daughter here and I can't let you come in. You'll have to go somewhere else. And with that, she closed the door in his face and he walked on to another place where he could find shelter. And the next day, the mother became terrified when she opened the paper and saw the picture of the man who had stood at her door. The man who could bring life to her daughter. And she had slammed the door in his face. An isolated tragedy. It's an oft-told tale how Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And we don't let him in. You see, if he comes in, he's going to transform us. He's going to make all things new. He's going to wrest from us all of the impurities that we have cultivated. He's going to give us a new philosophy of life. And we keep the door closed. Possibly opening it a crack, okay, catch a glimpse of him to see that he's still there, but never really letting him in. Not taking him seriously. If we take Jesus seriously, then we have but one recourse, and that is to follow his demand, follow me. We can't accept Jesus in our life and not follow him. The two just won't merge. To not follow him is the reject in itself. And so if we are to be a disciple of our Lord, to let him into our lives, to be the recipient of the gifts that he brought, then we must follow him. And to follow our Lord is to go to the places where he's been. We have to follow our Lord into the wilderness. 
For it is in the wilderness that we hammer out the credo by which we live. It is here we wrestle with the possibilities of our life and determine what is to be the philosophy we live by. To attempt life without a philosophy, to attempt to live without a creed is like trying to write a musical composition without a theme. It's like trying to write a book without a plot. It becomes meaningless prose, goes nowhere, and we must have a clear understanding of our expectations of life and how we go about fulfilling them. To live without a philosophy, to live by, is to live a life that goes about in circles and eventually weakens and collapse at the foot of the mountain of possibility. In the wilderness that we follow Jesus, we come to grips with the importance that we put upon the material life as opposed to the spiritual life. Let Jesus speak. You cannot serve both God and mammon. If you serve the one, you don't serve the other. You can't serve both. We try to plant one foot in each. To have all of the materialistic advantages of life and have all of the spiritual advantages of life without seeing the cost that comes for choosing either. Jesus faced that in the wilderness. He was given the possibility of being a ruler over all the world. Or he could reject that and become the spiritual knight for the people. Bow down and worship me, said the tempter, and I will give you all of the world, all of the empires of the world. But Jesus chose rather to renounce the things of the world to have no place to lay his head, but to follow the will of the Lord, of his God. In the wilderness, we make a decision as to whether our lives will be built upon show or substance. Too many things that we surround ourselves with are things that impress others, that give evidence of some possibilities within us, but there's little substance there. Tear away the trappings from so many and you find total emptiness. It is only a shell of that which we have created on the outside for show. Jesus was tempted to do just that. The tempter said, get up on the temple and while everybody gathers in awe of your impending death, leap off into space and settle down easily upon the ground, and everybody will follow you. Show. He could have done that, you know. But let me tell you what he did instead. If anyone is to be my disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me. Substance, not show. It's easy for us to give appearances. It's something else. To be. We are faced with the prospect of where we're going to lay up our treasures, whether on earth or in heaven, and we have the choice. Jesus repeatedly set the two before us. Elijah on Mount Carmel addressed the people that were gathered and said, How long will you vacillate between the two? Choose. 
And in the wilderness, we come to determine whether we are going to live our lives with the expectation that there is a life beyond this that we want to be prepared for, or whether we're going to live as though this is the only life, and we're going to live it with gusto, because life goes around just once. If we follow Christ, we can't escape the wilderness, because that's where we hammer out the philosophy that ultimately we're going to live by. And if we follow Christ, we must climb the mountain that he climbed. There's no more inspiring words in Scripture than those that describe Jesus on the mountain where he was in the company of the saints, where he was talking with the Father and where the spiritual experience was so great that he illumined as though he were radioactive. You see, that can happen to us. We can have communion with the saints, too, and we can have conversation with God. But we can't until we have climbed the mountain where we have so disciplined our lives, so committed our lives, that now the saints can come in. Now God can come in. We who attempt to live our lives without trysts with God, without spending time in prayer and meditation, without taking some part daily in order to shore up our sagging faith and to reintroduce into our minds and hearts the great truths that Christ taught, can't cope. We can't master life without those times apart. And so if we are to follow Christ, we must climb the mountain that he climbed. If we are to follow Christ, we must follow him into the garden. Mountain climbing is easy compared to walking into the garden. There is such a figurative expression of God throughout the Bible having to do with the garden. It all began in a garden. And the most important decision ever made took place in a garden. Jesus went into the garden at Gethsemane. He walked at a distance from his disciples where he would be alone, and he faced one dilemma. Will I cling to my feeble will, or will I succumb to God's will? We rarely take seriously the struggle through which Jesus went. Please don't say that it wasn't a struggle. Please don't say he knew that he was going to the cross and he just sat down and rested in the garden before they came. Don't take away from him those hours of pleading in such great energy and force that sweat fell from his brow as drops of blood. Don't put words in his mouth that weren't there because these are the words that were recorded, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus laid down the great debate there in the garden my will versus God's will. And we must come to that. The victory of the garden came when Jesus said, not my will, but your will. Do we have the spiritual integrity that we can say that to God? Not what I want, but what you want of me? We must. If we follow him, if we follow our Lord, we can't escape the garden 
the point at which we face God with a choice of our will or His. And if we come away, Thy will be done, the battle is won. Thomas Merton was a poet, a novelist, a religious writer, a theologian, perhaps the most read religious writer of the 20th century. He was born in France of rich parents, but he was orphaned at an early age, and he was the recipient of a trust that his parents had set up for him, a trust that would give him luxury for the rest of his life. And he began living the life of luxury. There was no limit to what he was able to do with the trust that had been set up for him. He was educated in France and then went to England for study. And while there he was involved with a young woman and she gave birth to an illegitimate child, one that he could not claim as his own. He provided for her care but would never become the father that he should have been. And the mother and the child would die in a bombing in World War II and take away from him the possibility of ever making restitution. It was a struggle to live with. But he lived a wild life. For 23 years, he spread his wild oats wherever he could find the ground to let them settle. And then he came to his moment in Gethsemane. Where is this kind of life leading me? In a story very reminiscent of Francis of Assisi, he renounced all of his worldly goods and went into a monastery. He went to the Trappist Monastery in, appropriately of all places, Gethsemane, Kentucky. And there he took a vow of silence. But his pen was not silent. In those years of self-imposed silence, he wrote his autobiography and he called it The Seven Story Mountain. And in it, he told of his struggle for spiritual reality. He told how he had come through the times of seeking the pleasures of the world only to discover there were no pleasures there, of inflicting pain upon others whose lives he touched. He wanted to be rid of the carnal appetite. He wanted to be spiritually immersed. And so he turned to the church. He said at the age of 23, he came into the church and he saw symbolically in the water there by which he would be baptized as the release of the demons that had controlled his life. And he visualized as he knelt there at the altar and the water was sprinkled upon his head. He visualized the demons leaving as every drop fell. And he said, I felt totally cleansed. And then the great moment came. I was to take Holy Communion. In that church, one could not take Holy Communion until he or she was baptized. And so he had never been privileged to take Communion. And now he could. And he said, I knelt there, and the priest held the piece of bread above my lips. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And as he laid that piece of bread upon my tongue, I felt imaginatively the entry of Christ into my life. And the crucifixion took place in that moment for my sins. He said, I walked out of that church rejoicing. I never dreamed that life could be so full. I had been cleansed and I had been filled with the nature of Christ. He died an untimely death at 53, but he had lived a hundred lifetimes in his spiritual gaze.
he came to his Gethsemane, he made his choice. We can't follow Christ until we follow him to the places that he has been, into the wilderness places where we hammer out our philosophies to live by to the mountaintop where we come to have communion with the saints and with God, and into Gethsemane where we make our ultimate choice whether we will live by our own whim or by the will of God. And to not follow him is to not take him seriously. And to not take him seriously is to close the door in his face and to close the door in his face, we keep on dreaming of leprechauns and magic genies and imaginative forces that can bring to us the things we really hunger for. And now this. Every road that we travel in our search for peace ultimately brings us to the feet of Christ. It is he and he alone who can give us the kingdom. Amen.